Hi there, I'm Matt Ryan. I'm Luke Labor. Thanks for coming to this presentation. And uh, we have a lot to cover, so we're just going to get started. Um, <clears throat> we are assuming that you are here because you're interested in performance and that you already understand its importance. We don't, then we don't need to convince you of that. Um, that you are wanting to improve your site's performance, but you may not know where to start or what the best uh, approach is to, uh, to really making a difference. Um, so in the past year, we have been uh, working on an ongoing effort to improve the performance of one of the major web properties that we are responsible for, which is the Penn State uh, World Campus uh, prospect site. And uh, we've uh, learned a lot. We've 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 had uh, done a lot. We've run into enough <laughs> various issues um, to say that you know we we've been we we've been in this for a while. And um, through that process, we've kind of uh, developed a, an outline of you know how uh, you might be able to uh, learn from our experience and and make your site faster. Um, so we've developed these six steps. And we um, are interested in sort of unpacking uh, how, how these uh, various aspects of the work um, fit together. And uh, this presentation is sort of going to be structured around uh, going through these steps one by one. Uh, so the first step is just getting a, a baseline understanding of performance metrics. Um, so when we started this project, the, the sort of landscape of performance metrics was a bit um, all over the place. Uh, there were a lot of them, um, and we it was it was uh, definitely a real effort to try to figure out what to use. Um, happily, uh, sort of partway through our process, um, Google introduced Core Web Vitals. Um, which has really simplified things uh, and established what's really new, really has become a new uh, industry standard for, for web performance. So what I'm going to do is kind of, we're not going to worry too much about these more classic metrics, and we're going to focus on the core web vitals. If you uh, were at yesterday's lightning talk by Eric Runyon, this may be a bit of review, um, <clears throat> but we, we hope it's, it's useful to, uh, to cover. So the three core web vitals are largest contentful paint, first input delay, and cumulative layout shift. Now I'll go through what each of these is. Um, so uh, largest contentful paint is probably the closest thing to what we uh, intuitively think of when we think of web performance. It really measures how fast a page appears to load. Um, it goes by the acronym LCP, um, and the, sort of it specifically measures sort of when the largest element with content appears on the page. So it doesn't wait until everything's rendered. It says, okay, when does it kind of, when does the biggest chunk of the page uh, show up? Um, for each of these metrics, Google has helpfully provided uh, some thresholds. Um, so, so there's essentially three bins that a given page could fall into for, for each metric. Um, and for this, for LCP, a uh, page is considered good if this is less than two and a half seconds in, needs improvement between two and a half seconds and four seconds, and is poor if it's over four seconds. Um, the second uh, of the metrics is first input delay. And this measures uh, another aspect of performance, specifically, basically, how responsive is the page to interaction um, when after it becomes, after it's rendered or once it's rendered. So. Um, you know, if you've ever interacted with a page where it appears to load, but nothing is happening for a while, um, this page has probably a poor first input delay. It goes by the acronym FID, um, and the, uh, it's specifically a measure of the very first time the user interacts with the page, how long it takes for that interaction to actually um, sort of fire or, or, or occur. Um, <clears throat> A page is considered good if it's less than 100 milliseconds, needs improvement between 100 and 300 milliseconds, and is poor um, if it's over 300 milliseconds. Um, and then the third metric is cumulative layout shift, or CLS. 
Um, <clears throat> uh, this is uh, an issue you have probably seen on pages that load ads as the page jumps around and content reflows uh, at various intervals as different elements of the page load in. Um, <clears throat> and so this metric is not expressed in uh, time. It's instead expressed as the, a proportion of the page area uh, impacted by this reflow. Um, and the page is considered good if it less than a tenth of the page is affected, needs improvement between a tenth and a quarter, and is poor if more than a quarter of the page uh, is, is jumping around. So those are the three um, metrics um, that uh, Core Web Vitals uh, introduced. Um, <clears throat> And uh, there's, there's three really nice things about them. The fact that there are just three metrics, unlike the sort of universe we saw before, um, they're each measuring a clearly distinct aspect of page performance. And then finally, they're really focused on the impact on the user. So there might be different things going on, the, on under the hood um, that might uh, you know, cause one or, the, uh, one or the other of these to um, show a problem, um, but they really are things that a user will you know, would be able to note themselves. Um, so we, uh, you know, we've adopted Core Web Vitals, um, and we think that, you know, at this point in time, you know, those are clearly the, the metrics that, that it, the whole industry is moving towards. Um, so step two is to decide on your performance goals. Um, it's good to have goals. It's good to have something to be aiming for. Um, and it's good to kind of know when uh, your, your sort of initial phase of getting your site into a place that you're happy with from a performance standpoint, when that phase is done and when you can kind of move more into an operationalized, you know, sort of maintaining that uh, performance. So um, <clears throat> we initially started looking at a behavioral approach to this, you know, kind of what, how, what impact on user behavior does different, um, you know, uh, performance have we uh, see that you know there's a lot of information out there showing you know that that it does impact uh, behavior bounce rate goes up as performance is worse conversion rate goes down pages per session go down so you know theoretically we could say okay these these should tell us um, something about what our goals should be uh, however um, it's really hard to get solid data on this. The data that's out there doesn't always entirely agree. This is varying metrics. Many of those metrics are older metrics that you know, we, we wouldn't necessarily be using now. And then the line is still a somewhat subjective line. You know, where on that curve of impact are you really comfortable? Well, that's really a subjective um, question. So um, we took an easier route. We decided we simply wanted to be good as far as Google was concerned. So we just needed to be in that green zone uh, for each of the three metrics. And uh, you know, one of the nice things about taking this easy route is it's also really easy to justify these goals. Um, uh, you know, uh, Google uses these metrics to determine impact on uh, result pages. Um, so there's a big SEO you know, rationale for saying we want to be in this green zone. And um, they've also done a really good job of explaining the research about kind of what the, what, why, why the thresholds are set where they are. Um, and basically, when you're under these thresholds, a page should generally be perceived as you know, not having any major performance issues to uh, most users. Um, <clears throat> so the third sort of the third step in this process is to you know look at what tools are available to you um, and choose the right set of tools. And I say set because there are really two general types of measurement um, that uh, are part of uh, uh, looking at performance. Um, uh, first is a kind of lab tests, sometimes called synthetic testing, and the other is real user monitoring or RUM. Um, and these two types are complementary. Um, I'll get into the details of each of them, but sort of the high level uh, takeaway here is that you really should use both um, because neither of them get show you the full picture. Um, so a little bit about lab testing. Um, lab testing emulates browser requests. Uh, basically, you have a tool that um, sort of does a test uh, request of a page and then sort of renders it and um, 
you know, looks at the various timing metrics that occur when that, uh, that test run happens. It can be done on demand or on a schedule. Um, and uh, it's good at uh, checking code changes before you release them to production um, or other changes for that matter. Um, let's say you were, you know, trialing a new plugin, you could do that on a test server, check out the performance impacts um, before you actually uh, use it in production. Um, it uh, gives a much greater insight into what might actually be causing those high level, level performance issues. So it might give you those three metrics, but then you'll also get waterfalls, other um, detailed information about specific timings happening in the page that, might, that, that should help you really diagnose what you can do to improve things. Um, it's easy, it's relatively easy, although Luke's gonna get into more details about what you need to do, but it's certainly possible to develop a consistent testing protocol um, that can be you know, both automated, also allow checks on demand. Um, it has some significant areas of drawbacks. Uh, <clears throat> basically, you're generally only gonna be testing a basket of pages, uh, not every page on the site. So if a performance issue is showing up on a given page that's not one of the ones that you're monitoring, you might not show up in lab testing. Um, there are some metrics it can't capture. Um, first input delay, it can't capture because that just looks at you know, what, a real what happens when a real user does an interaction on the page, whatever it is. Um, and so it can't really, we can't really fake that out. Um, generally, lab tests use uh, time to interactive uh, as kind of a proxy for that, um, but it's not quite the same as the canonical metric. Um, we also, when we're doing lab testing, we have to make assumptions about, you know, what kinds of devices, how much power they have, what kind of bandwidth they have. And so, you know, we try to make it representative, but it really doesn't represent the full spectrum of what are the real devices and real network conditions that uh, users experience when they visit our sites. Uh, real user monitoring is kind of the flip side of the coin. So real user monitoring uh, rather than being sort of a controlled environment in the lab, that's sort of looking at what is the real wild west, wild world experience of real users on your production uh, sites. So um, things that are great about it, you can monitor all the pages, service performance issues, sort of no matter where it comes from. Um, <clears throat> it really is because it is capturing what's really happening. Um, it's a little bit harder to argue with. <laughs> um, it's so, so for that reason, it's sometimes considered a little bit more gold standard data. Um, and uh, you can get, uh, there, there are sources of data that don't require any additional effort or instrumentation um, because uh, Google, for example, is kind of monitoring the whole web's performance right now uh, through um, Chrome UX report. Um, it has some drawbacks. Uh, the major drawback, one major drawback is it really is only looking at performance web or sorry, production web pages. So you can't use it to like look at what's going to happen uh, before you roll something into production. Um, <clears throat> uh, if you want uh, more detailed or more up to date data than what you can get from a source like Chrome UX report, you need to add additional code to your pages, sometimes pay extra for a monitoring service. Um, so uh, those, those are, are some significant drawbacks to real user monitoring. And I think one other thing I'll add to this is that it doesn't give you the detailed diagnostic information about uh, why the problems are happening. It's much better at surfacing whether problems are happening. Um, so there's a bunch of tools out there on both sides uh, for lab testing. This is a list of tools that we looked at. Um, we'll get a little bit later into um, details about you know, what, what we went with, um, but all of these can, can do lab testing. There are even more out there. Um, some are a little bit more DIY and a number of them are kind of a paid service that, that sort of does its soup to nuts for you. Um, <clears throat> on the real user monitoring side, you see that there are some similar names here. So there are some services like Speed Curve and Pingdom, which sort of offer a, you know, entirely integrated both real user monitoring and lab testing suite um, that you can buy. Um, but then there are also uh, tools which uh, are, are free that you can use. Um, one thing I'll note here that's key about the Chrome UX report is this is the 
uh, RUM data that Google uses canonically to uh, determine impact on search engine results. Um, and that you can see it in Google Search Console speed reports. So no matter what other uh, RUM tooling you might choose to use, it's always useful to keep an eye on this, um, if only for, from a like, sort of SEO perspective. Um, so after looking at the tool, sort of the, our, our tool universe, um, <clears throat> we landed on these. Um, some of the big considerations for us were we needed things that essentially had zero additional cost. Um, <clears throat> that was a constraint that, that uh, we sort of uh, discovered partway through our process. And so that, that steered us in, in this direction. Um, we were already using Cloudflare, um, so we were just simply able to turn on a, a functionality that was already part of that subscription. And then the rest of these can be done at low or, or no cost. Um, but your situation might be different. Um, I would say that my recommendation would be to pick some tools that will get you going. Um, it's not, this isn't like critical. You mostly want to get going and get some tools that start giving you visibility and you can always change your tools later on if needed. Um, so once we had a plan put together, um, we uh, put together a presentation that we, uh, where, where we outlined you know, why performance was important. We talked about some of the user experience uh, uh, aspects. We, we explained how it was going to be impacting SEO. We um, talked about how it impacted conversion rate and other business goals. Um, and we also did some testing versus some of our competitors and showed where we were landing in the competitive landscape, which wasn't pretty and I think helped people open some eyes there too. Um, we outlined what tools we were planning to use, um, what our goals were, and probably the biggest thing is we set some expectations about, you know, that's, that this was going to be a gradual process to get to the goals. This wasn't going to be something where we flip a switch. Um, and that this was going to be an ongoing effort. Um, sort of down the line. So um, we got pretty solid buy-in. It helped that Google was, um, you know, had an upcoming deadline for when uh, performance was going to start uh, impacting SEO. And, um, you know, that we had chosen a route that didn't, that, that wasn't, you know, asking for a lot of money basically to make this happen. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Luke. Thanks, Matt. I'm going to be picking up, you know, getting sort of into the more nuts and bolts of, you know, how can you get your site, you know, into a good position to, to be, you know, testable via, you know, both RUM and lab testing. Um, so I'm going to step right in. Um, in. In our case, for real user monitoring, you know, it, like Matt said, we just had to flip a switch in Cloudflare. It was, you know, really quick and easy. Um, Search Console was already set up and ready to go out of the box. You know, we had no additional effort uh, there either. Um, for the lab testing portion, we did have to do some, you know, additional CI scripting and, you know, set up some additional uh, processes there. And we also needed to set up some additional cloud infrastructure. Um, so I'm going to step into the next slide. And this is sort of a to-do list. Um, to sort of get you in a good position to start um, to start lab testing. Um, number one, you're going to want to use version control. You know, if you're not using version control, there's going to be no real easy way to you know drop a flag on you know a, a specific point in time so you can go back and look at what your performance was. Um, you're going to want to set up a stable and isolated test environment. So that means you know you're not using any shared hosting stuff that might have an unpredictable load, um, no spot instances in AWS, for example. Um, you're going to also want to ensure that your test infrastructure is you know as close to production as you can get. Um, so that means you know the same web server configuration, same load balancer configuration, um, you know same CDN settings between test and production. Um, a really nice to have feature is, you know, the ability to toggle settings in your test infrastructure without impacting production. And that becomes really important when you're trying to optimize your infrastructure. So, you know, say you want to try out, you know, HTTP version three versus version two. Um, you, the ability to do that in the test environment before impacting production is really helpful. Um, you'll also want to ensure that your caching layers can be effectively warmed prior to testing. Um, and, that could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, you'll also need to set up, you know, any additional lab testing software that you choose to go with. 
Um, in our case, we went with Lighthouse CI, and you know that involved setting up you know two additional uh, pieces of software. That was the Lighthouse client, um, you know, which actually runs you know the Chrome browsers and you know visits the uh, test application, gathers metrics, and that'll turn around and upload results to the Lighthouse server portion. Um, the Lighthouse server portion it. Um, saves and displays results, you know, through a web user interface so that, you know, anybody on your team, even non-technical users can go in and sort of review these, uh, the test runs. Um, it can also, this whole thing can be kicked off either via, via manual push button, or even if you can plumb it into your uh, CI system as a build step. Um, the next thing you're going to want to do is, you know, sort of drill down and define your testing scope. You're going to want to figure out, you know, which pages you want to measure. Um, and you'll probably want to target, you know, what are the most important pages on your site? Which ones have the highest ROI? Um, another consideration you could look at, you know, are there any page types or in WordPress's cases, uh, post types that make up the majority of site content? So you can, you know, grab one of those and cover most of your site pretty easily. Um, you'll want to also determine, you know, how many times should each page be tested. Um, generally speaking, the more tests run against a page, uh, the more reliable the results are going to be once they're averaged out. Um, you're also going to want to ask yourself, you know, how long does it take the test runner to actually, you know, complete a test? And this could vary based on, you know, the software you choose, um, you know, the resources available to the test runner in your application itself. Um, you know, next up, you're going to want to figure out, you know, how long do your caches stay warm? Um, and with the last two points, you're basically going to want to make sure that your entire test run, that's every page that you're measuring multiplied by the number of tests multiplied by the time per test, you know, will actually fit in your cache warming period. So essentially, you don't want your cache to go stale in the middle of a test run. Um, another key point that I'll talk about a little bit is uh, dealing with variance. Um, when you're running lab testing, uh, you're going to see small differences between runs, you know, even if you don't, you know, change anything. And, and that's perfectly normal. But if your results are wildly inconsistent, uh, you know, there could be a variance problem going on. Um, variance is just another word to describe sort of the random stuff that can happen um, on a page load that you might not directly control. And I've added a link there that really goes into a lot of detail. Um, but on your site, you know, common sources, they can include, you know, cold caches, which hopefully we've addressed in the previous slide, um, randomized content, A-B testing, or, you know, anything GTM might inject or any other third-party assets that you, that you might not really control. Um, so to take care of that, you'll either want to remove or normalize these uh, variant sources. Um, so, you know, can static content become, or randomized content, can that become static content easily? Um, you know, can you turn off, you know, some of these third party assets? Can you turn off your A-B tooling in the test environment? Um, you know, also, can you, you know, block certain URL patterns, you know, from loading in the uh, test browser? Um, it's going to take us into step five, you know, once you're in a good position to start running tests, um, the first thing you're going to want to do is, uh, you know, take a baseline reading, um, you know, and from that you can sort of dive in and, and look at what's going on and, you know, identify anything that, you know, seems to be, you know, a worse defender um, or things that might seem easy on the surface to fix. Um, you know, and some things they might be a little more complicated or reduce site functionality and you might have to negotiate those with your stakeholders. Um, you know, some things that you want to improve, they might actually introduce regressions in other performance areas. And, you know, that might not be a, a deal breaker depending on, you know, your, your current budget in that other area. Um, you also want to keep an eye out for things that you might have seen in real user monitoring uh, show up as a problem. Um, once you've identified, you know, the different things you're going to want to sort of document each of them so you know document what it does now you know what it's going to do after it's optimized you know any potential risks or side effects involved um, and you know just a quick hypothesis on you know what metrics you're aiming to improve um, also include a level of effort on you know each one of these items um, and once you have you know all that documented you can now start to prioritize stuff 
Um, in our case, we started by optimizing any infrastructure related components before we sort of moved on to the application. And, you know, then we prioritized, you know, getting started on the, the worst offenders followed by some of the easy to fix issues. Um, next up, this is just a, in, a graphic that's sort of uh, detailing, you know, how to find out, you know, one example of something that might be a, a performance contributor here. Um, so this is looking at uh, long running main thread tasks um, within light, a lighthouse run. And if you look up here, it's basically it's pointing to YouTube and reCAPTCHA. Um, and this is a run, a real run that we took on our site. Um, but there's a wealth of information available in here that well exceeds the scope of <laughs> this presentation. Um, once you've identified stuff, it's time to start executing things. You're going to want to just do one at a time. Uh, deploy the change to a test environment, rerun the test, and then you're going to want to look at every result. You know, that's every page that you've tested. Um, you know, you might improve one page, but regress on another. Um, so reviewing everything is really important. Um, you also want to, you know, make sure the optimization is is worth it. You know, does it does it get you enough to you know justify doing it? Um, you know, once approved, roll it out to production. Um, then be sure to uh, you know check the real user monitoring to make sure that lab testing you know actually predicted what was going to happen. Um, and this is just a, a image of you know what happened after we had optimized reCAPTCHA. You can see our LCP went down by you know roughly two seconds, which was pretty substantial in our case. Um, getting into some of the things we've optimized, um, the two biggest offenders here were uh, reCAPTCHA 3 that we were loading on the site. Um, also, YouTube assets were pretty big. There were a bunch of other you know, smaller things that individually weren't very significant, but, you know, once we've optimized all of them together, it turned out to, you know, save quite a bit of time. I won't go through them all, but they'll be available in the slides. Um, there were some things we also didn't do, um, optimizations we didn't make, uh, time to first byte. We were all already serving content in, you know, less than 60 milliseconds, so the server side was blazing fast already. Um, We've also investigated using images with progressive encoding. And as you can see in the image down here, um, WebP format actually turned out to be about 200 milliseconds faster. And we were able to measure that with this tool. Um, we also attempted to uh, utilize a more sophisticated and complex aggregation module. Turns out that didn't pan out. So we just excluded that uh, complexity. Oops. So things that we may yet explore, um, this is sort of the to-do list that we didn't get around to tackling yet. Um, we're gonna try turning on quick via the CDN, that's HTTP3. We'll try self-hosting web fonts and uh, maybe even migrating away from Font Awesome. Uh, we're gonna investigate preloading some LCP images to see if we can get uh, that metric down a bit more. Um, we're also gonna try adding uh, critical CSS generation to our themes build process. Um, Next, I'm going to walk into sort of operationalizing, you know, or how to avoid backsliding. Um, you know, once you've met a goal, turn it into a budget. Budgets are a lot easier to manage. Um, run a performance test on every merge request into the main branch or, you know, when third party code changes that you don't directly control and make it easy to do so, because if this isn't easy, developers aren't going to run it. Um, you're going to want to routinely monitor RUM statistics. Um, or even better yet, if you can automate those and set up, you know, alerts so you can get an email or something when, you know, a budget violation is detected. Um, you'll want to also have a communication plan in place so that nobody stresses out, you know, uh, when, not if a budget violation happens because it's going to happen. Um, looking here, the last nine months of real user data uh, via Google Search Console. Uh, we started out, you know, not so good and we took some baby steps and you can see that eventually, you know, we got into the green on the site. Um, just recently, we see there's a little bit of regression happening and we can drill down a little bit deeper via Search Console. It'll actually give you the metrics that changed and drilling down even deeper, it'll give you examples of the URLs that, you know, things actually changed on. Um, I'll just mention that, you know, these graphs are not real time. so don't pay too close attention to the dates that things happen. Um, Matt, I'm gonna pass it back to you to cover our takeaways. 
Thanks, Luke. Um, <clears throat> so over the past year, we've learned a lot, and uh, Luke and I put our heads together and and you know said, okay, what are the what are the main things that um, you know we think should be guiding principles um, for for any team that's attempting this. Um, the first one is uh, simply to make sure that as many decisions as possible are data driven. Um, there's a lot of noise out there about you know what you should and shouldn't do um, in terms of specific changes to pages, um, but you know we've found that uh, those don't always uh, equate to exactly what's going to help your performance on your site with your setup. Um, so it really helps to to establish a really good foundation of data. Um, and then drive your, your decisions from that. Um, the second uh, principle is, is to really uh, sort of make sure that stakeholders are on board. Um, this does take effort um, and both, you know, sort of initial effort to sort of to achieve your goals. And then there is ongoing effort to continue to maintain the budget. So, um, you know, build that expectation, make sure people, everyone's aware that it's an ongoing commitment and that everyone's bought in in terms of, you know, that, that, this, is, that this is really valuable uh, work to be doing. Um, <clears throat> uh, the third one is to, uh, you know, get, get really clear about, uh, you know, that, that, your, that the changes you are making are in fact improving your performance in the ways that you need it to be improved before you implement them. Um, it's entirely possible to make things worse um, when you're trying to make things better. Um, uh, the fourth one is to make sure that uh, performance is really becomes part of your team's DNA. So um, we think of this it, as sort of a parallel to um, the way that accessibility really needs to be built in to every part of um, a, a team's work. Um, performance really should be thought of at every step in the process as well. Um, testing should be a standard procedure, but we should also be asking questions early on, perhaps in design phases, um, you know, uh, how, how is this going to impact performance or, you know, what potential performance issues could arise um, if, we, if we do this and how might we mitigate those. Um, and then finally, to really uh, make sure that you have uh, solid communication and um, sort of commitment to performance um, among all of the players, all the people who are contributing some aspect of the site that can impact performance. Often, sometimes this stuff ends up just on the devs, but really devs often only control a particular part of a site's performance. Um, you know, design can impact it, content can impact it, um, sort of things that are happening in analytics and GTM and third party code land can, can really significantly impact it. And so kind of everybody needs to be, you know, part of, part of the, the team that is uh, caring about this and, and working together to achieve goals. Um, so with that, um, we're going to wrap up. Um, thank you for uh, coming to this presentation, and uh, we're happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for attending.